Good afternoon and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Ethan Lierens and I am proud to be a researcher at the Jerusalem Institute of Justice. Before we begin our lecture today on the subject of the relationship between Hamas and Fatah, I would like to tell you shortly about the Jerusalem Institute of Justice. The JIJ is a leading legal research institute that strives to uphold human rights in the Middle East and safeguard the legitimate standing of the State of Israel among the nations. The JIJ is proud to hold the most prestigious consultative status to the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations for our contribution to the protection of human rights. Our International Law and Public Diplomacy Department operates both in the international legal and public diplomacy arenas. The era of political instability that dominated our political landscape in recent years came to an end last month, and the internal Palestinian political establishment is seething. The Palestinian political sphere since the 1980s has been torn and split between two leaderships. One is led by the designated terrorist organization Hamas, which currently controls the Gaza Strip, while the other is the ruling party in Judea and Samaria, Fatah, which was previously the Palestinian Liberation Organization, also known as the PLO. In March, the President of the Palestinian Authority and the head of the Fatah movement, Mahmoud Abbas, will celebrate his 88th birthday. How long will he retain his leadership of Fatah? The morning after, Abbas will bring about significant changes for us all. The identity of his successor and the impact on the status of Hamas will in many ways dictate the future of the Israeli-Palestinian relationship for quite some time. However, the Palestinian political instability has no effect on the growing international pressure on Israel to make significant moves towards the two-state solution, which envisions an independent state of Palestine alongside the state of Israel. It seems that these voices ignore one basic and important question. With whom should Israel act to promote this initiative? In order to answer this question, we must first get a better understanding of the two factions that make up the Palestinian political landscape. So in today's session, we will explore the relationship between these two organizations, Fatah and Hamas, since their founding. We will first discuss the background behind the establishments of the two parties, their aims and their differing ideologies. We will then elaborate on how the conflict between the two parties began and how it evolved. We will then go on to analyze the popularity of both parties among Palestinians today, what this means for the current political climate, and how Palestinian politics have significant impact on Israel and any potential peace process. With me today is Advocate Uri Morad, the Director of the JIJ's International Law and Public Diplomacy Department. Welcome, Uri. Good afternoon, Ethan. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here with you today. Indeed, the relationship between the main political Palestinian parties is an incredibly important issue to discuss. We at the JIJ spent significant amount of time analyzing foreign relations and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but rarely do we get such an opportunity to understand the inner workings of Palestinian domestic politics. Absolutely. So what has been happening recently in the West Bank and Gaza that makes the topic of our webinar so relevant? Yes, well, there is a deepening rift between the Gaza Strip, which is under Hamas's control, as you've mentioned before, and the West Bank, which is under Fatah's control. The split has deepened in recent years, and any attempt at reconciliation has ultimately failed. We know that the 88-year-old leader of Fatah, Mahmoud Abbas, also known as Abu Mazen, has been suffering from health issues and his passing will leave the Palestinian political system in great uncertainty. Without a clear mechanism for the transfer of power, without a designated successor. Therefore, after Abbas's death, it is highly likely that a power struggle will occur over claims to the throne within the ranks of Fatah and a split between the powers of the government currently held by Abbas. Furthermore, it is likely that Hamas will make a play for gaining a stronger foothold in the West Bank, potentially even attempting to seize power. Regarding that last note, 
It would be great if you could share with us how Hamas's power has evolved in the West Bank in recent years. Of course, Hamas is becoming more and more visible in the West Bank and is acting boldly and provocatively towards the Palestinian Authority. In some instances, PA security forces actually avoid confronting Hamas activists even when they are armed and operating openly against its forces. For example, in Jenin or in university campuses. Actually, Hamas's rising influence in the West Bank is a direct result of a change in strategy by the Hamas leadership in Gaza, who decided to use the West Bank as a leverage to promote its objectives in Gaza and to establish the status of its leaders in general. Its involvement in the West Bank has increased through the funding of terrorist cells in Hamas-affiliated university groups. For instance, just recently, in September 2022, Israel arrested a group of students at the Birzet University near Ramallah for funneling funds to Hamas in Gaza. Evidence of Hamas's growing military strength in the West Bank is clear in the noticeable rise of arrests made by Israel. Also in the large number of attacks that has been prevented and the development of independent terror infrastructures across the West Bank, especially in the area of Nablus. Please give us an example, Ori. Yeah, so the, the Lion's Den, uh, for example, is a terrorist organization founded in Nablus just recently in July 2022 by a 25-year-old Palestinian named Muhammad al-Azizi. The group has committed several shooting attacks on Israeli settlements and different military outputs. Their only deadly attack happened on the 11th of October when a 21-year-old IDF soldier, Ido Baruch, was killed by a gunman of the Lion's Den near the settlement of Shovei Shomron in the north of the West Bank. The Israeli security forces have cracked down on this group, having arrested or killed several of its militants while the other members of the organization surrendered to the Palestinian Authority. The group has also risen in popularity extremely quickly among Palestinians in the West Bank who regularly share their videos on TikTok and Telegram. The Israeli security establishment has identified that group, which was thought to have been independent, in fact received support and arms from Hamas in the West Bank and Gaza and has also receiving funds from Hamas's branch in Turkey. Hamas has no interest in creating a direct confrontation with Israel at the moment, so it shouldn't surprise us that they were allowing other groups to fight against Israel instead of themselves. So now that we've discussed current events and why the topic of today's webinar is so relevant, let's start from the beginning. Let's take a deeper look into the Palestinian political parties. Hamas and Fatah have been vying for power since Hamas began participating in Palestinian politics in 2006. Yes, Ethan, so let's start with Fatah. Fatah was founded in 1959 by several Palestinians living in the diaspora. Yasser Arafat, then the head of a union of Palestinian students in Cairo University, Salah Khalef, Khalil al-Wazir, and Khalid Yashiruti. Fatah was founded as a Palestinian nationalist, social democratic political party, and was a response to the pan-Arabism ideology led by Egyptian President Jamal Abdel Nasser. Fatah's doctrine, was an uncompromising guerrilla war against Israel, was originally intended to drag the Arab states into a conflict with Israel, even against their will if needed. After the Six-Day War, Fatah became the dominant force in Palestinian politics when he joined the Palestinian Liberation Organization, known as the PLO, and gained 33 out of the 105 seats in the PLO Executive Committee. The party constitutes the largest faction of the PLO. Mahmoud Abbas is currently the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, the head of Fatah, and is also the president of the PLO. Very interesting. And what about the history of Hamas? Yes, yeah, so Hamas is an acronym for Harkat al Mukawama al Islamiya, meaning in English Islamic Resistance Movement. Hamas was founded in December 1987. 20 years after Fatah, by leading figures of Palestinian Muslim Brotherhoods in support of the Palestinian uprising against Israel in the First Intifada, which broke out that same year. The main founder of Hamas was Ahmad Yassin, a man who was later infamous for orchestrating numerous terror attacks and approving the launch of Qassam rockets against Israeli cities. Hamas has continually called for an armed struggle against Israel 
and has asserted that no Arab leader has the right to give up land to Israel whilst labeling any attempt at reconciliation with Israel or Jews in general to be a crime. Hamas is the first Palestinian organization to merge the ideologies of Palestinian nationalism together with Islamism. Can you give us some more detail on Fatah's ideology? Of course. Fatah's original ideology was one of Palestinian nationalism. They sought the liberation of Palestine from Israeli control through waging low-intensity guerrilla warfare. Furthermore, they demanded the right for all Palestinian refugees to return to Israel through the concept of the right of return, which seeks to allow Palestinians who fled their homes during the 1948 war and their descendants to return to Israel. Have there been any notable changes to this ideology? There have been some incredibly important changes. Whilst Fatah originally adopted a militant ideology, which manifested in its armed faction, El Asifa, through which it conducted terror missions, it has since renounced terror. In 1988, Arafat, as the head of the PLO, recognized the state of Israel, rejected terror, embraced the possibility of a two-state solution, and was prepared to pursue peace negotiations with Israel. This marked a stark change in Fatah's ideology. The need for the PLO to be recognized by the international community, as well as Fatah's political responsibility towards Palestinian civilians, has driven it to renounce its previous violent ideology in favor of peace. And Hamas's ideology? It is against the very backdrop of Fatah's ideological change that Hamas emerged as a fundamentalist Islamic organization. While it originated in support of the First Intifada, it also emerged as a symbolic rejection of the PLO's secular and moderate ideology, which was open to negotiations with the enemy, with Israel in this case. As expressed in its 1988 charter, Hamas aims to wage jihad to liberate Palestine, thus offering Palestinian nationalists a religious and more hardline alternative to the PLO. Hamas's original charter enumerates two specific aims to liberate Palestine from Israeli occupation and to establish an Islamic state from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. A key difference between the original ideologies of Fatah and Hamas is the emphasis on religion. Hamas's co-founder Yassin was convinced that the existence of Israel was an attempt to destroy Islam and so concluded that Muslims have an individual religious obligation to destroy Israel. Fatah, by contrast, appealed to more nationalist and secular motivations in its desire to oppose Israel. You mentioned that Hamas's current ideology differs from its original formulation. How do those ideologies compare to each other and to Fatah's current ideology? Yeah, so Hamas's original charter is rife with overt anti-Semitism, calls for jihad and the destruction of the state of Israel. It is inherently a fundamentalist religious document and cites the Quran to support itself. It proclaims that the fight against Jews is very great and very serious and cites the Hadith whereby the stones and the trees will call out to Muslims that there is a Jew hiding behind them whom they should kill. It goes on to say that there is no solution for the Palestinian question except through jihad and that any form of negotiations with Israel should be rejected. The religion differences between uh, Hamas and Fatah's original ideologies are clear. Fatah does not cite any religious obligation as they present themselves again as a nationalist liberation organization. Since Fatah's 1988 rejection of terror, the differences have become more apparent, as Fatah's acceptance of negotiation with Israel stand in stark contrast to the foundational extremist elements of Hamas's charter. There are distinct differences between Fatah and Hamas's original documents, yet in 2017 Hamas released an updated version of their charter, in which they reduced a significant amount of the anti-Semitism and calls for jihad, that were present in the original charter. Would you say that this has allowed for more ideological commonalities between the groups? And could this potentially mean that the two political parties are not as far apart as they originally were? It's 
It's a good question, Ethan. I think that it is important to consider the motivations behind the changes to the document in order to assess if it amounts to an actual change in Hamas's ideology. Many will make the mistake of looking at the 2017 charter and believe that due to the fact that Hamas has removed references to Jihad, it is now a more moderate and peaceful party. But in reality, it has replaced the religious element with a different but equally aggressive nationalistic focus. It still states that Israel should be resisted with all means and methods, but for the liberation of the Palestinian people rather than to realize the religious day of judgment which was mentioned in the original charter. It appears that the changes are not truly reflective of a more peaceful ideology, especially as terms of violence are still used as religious symbolism in Palestinian discourse, such as terrorists who have been killed by Israeli forces being referred to as martyrs. Exactly. The changes in the 2017 document are only semantic, rather than a real movement towards peace with Israel. It is politically important for Hamas to gain international recognition and legitimacy in order to gain funding, but also to boost its position in internal Palestinian politics. If on the surface it presents itself as a less religiously fanatical group, it is more likely to attract funding from the United Nations, from the European Union and other countries invested in the Middle East peace process. Additionally, the current political climate must be taken into context as well. The Fatah-dominated PA has grown weaker over time, meaning that Hamas may have an opportunity in the near future to seize power both within the PA and potentially the PLO, both of which are internationally recognized organizations. Therefore, presenting itself as a more reasonable movement with the capacity of international relations is advantageous in bolstering its position as a viable candidate for replacing Fatah as the sole legitimate representatives of the Palestinian people. Could you explain how Fatah and Hamas are organized and how much of a challenge Hamas is to Fatah? Of course, the Fatah movement operates through its three prominent institutions. There is the Central Committee, which is the most dominant body and serves as the executive arm. The General Conference, or the Parliament, uh, which basically includes approximately 300 to 500 members. Then there is the Revolutionary Council, which is the intermediate body, I would say, in the movement between the General Conference and the Central Committee. A sort of a limited parliament which has around 75 members. Hamas's leadership is split into three. A political wing, a military wing, and a social welfare wing. The political wing is led by a 15-member politburo known as the Magia al Shura, and it operates in exile and is made up of 15 members from Gaza, West Bank, Israeli prisons, and those in exile. It is the main decision-making body of Hamas. The military wing, named Ezzedin al Qassam Brigades, has around 10 to 17,000 operatives, and its primary objectives are to evoke the spirit of jihad among Palestinians and the worldwide Muslim community, and to fight against Israel until they have, in their view, liberated Palestine. The last body of Hamas is the social welfare, which is based on the model created by Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood. This wing focuses on building public support for engaging in community development projects and charitable activities. However, the amount this wing can accomplish is significantly limited due to the vast majority of Hamas's funding going towards military activity. Since Hamas won the PA parliamentary elections in 2006 with 42.9% of the vote, it gained 76 seats in the 132 seats Palestinian legislature. This was a turning point for Hamas as they had now became a dominant power in Palestinian internal politics. Abbas did not allow Hamas to take power smoothly and even though he appointed Ismail Haniyeh as the Prime Minister, he went to great length to stop him from having a functioning government. Abbas did this by retaining control over the Palestinian security forces and calling on professional unions to go on strike in protest of the new government. Hamas's victory in 2006 elections signified uh, a turn of events in internal Palestinian politics and served to ignite the Hamas Fatah conflict, which was put on hold during the 2006 Israel Gaza conflict, 
which basically erupted after Hamas kidnapped uh, the Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit. But after the fighting between Israel and Hamas ended, the violence between Fatah and Hamas militants resumed. Despite efforts by Saudi Arabia to create a Palestinian unity government in February 2007, the violent incidents continued through the next few months with over hundreds of people killed both from Hamas and from Fatah. In June 2007, Hamas took control over the Gaza Strip, killing dozens of Fatah officials and expelled the rest to the West Bank or Egypt. As a result, Fatah in the West Bank arrested hundreds of Hamas activists. Abbas declared the dissolution of the unity government, fired the Hamas uh, Prime Minister Ismail Haniyeh, and declared a state of emergency, allowing Abbas to rule through the presidential decrees. In addition, Abbas outlawed the military wing of Hamas, the Azadin and Qassam brigades. Wow, so what effects did Hamas's capture of the Gaza Strip have? So Hamas's grip over the Gaza Strip deepened the split between Gaza and the West Bank and created a greater problem, not only for Israel, by the way, but rather the entire region. It also damaged any attempt at reconciliation with Israel and severely damaged the quality of life of Palestinian civilians. While Abbas rejected any dialogue with Hamas, which led to a renewal of the peace talks between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, Hamas continued to conduct military conflicts with Israel of varying intensities, such as the Operation Kaslid back in 2008, followed by Operation Protective Edge in 2014, and the Guardian of the Walls operation in 2021. So, how popular is Hamas amongst the general Palestinian public today? For many Palestinians, Hamas is a good alternative for the PLO, who they view to be corrupt and compromising of Islamic ideals. Hamas seems to engage more authentically, I would say, with national pride and provides a religious version of the PLO's goals without giving away Palestinian land. V very interesting. So, have there been any specific catalysts for galvanizing support for Hamas in the past 40 years? Yes, yeah, so two events come to mind. In 1994, a Jewish settler named Baruch Goldstein massacred 29 Muslims while they were praying in a mosque in the cave of the Patriarchs in Hebron during the Ramadan. The Hebron massacre affected Hamas militancy and increased its popularity. For its first seven years, Hamas only attacked military targets, but after this point, it is no longer distinguished between military and civilian targets. Another important event that gained Hamas support was the Second Intifada, which began in the year of 2000. There was increased support for a more violent approach towards Israelis during the Second Intifada, and Hamas's suicide bombing campaign was popular among Palestinians. Something of note is that Hamas gained a significant amount of support following the Oslo peace process. The two incidents you just mentioned are acts of extreme violence that increased Hamas's popularity. It is ironic that the Oslo peace process would also bring Hamas popularity. That is a very important point, Ethan. There has been a Palestinian discontent during the Oslo peace process, as the reality on the ground did not match the expectations created by the peace agreement. Many of the goals laid out were not practically achievable, so by default Hamas profited from this discontent due to the fact that it was Yasser Arafat and Fatah who represented the Palestinian people in this peace process. Arafat represented Fatah within the PLO and when the peace agreements failed to bring about profitable outcomes, Hamas was a suitable alternative as it persistently opposed both Fatah and in form of peace negotiations. So it seems that as popular support for Hamas rose, support for Fatah fell. Exactly. The two groups, Fatah and Hamas, have effectively run parallel to each other and their respective popularity is mutually exclusive. They have both gained popular support at varying points, but always at the expense of the other. This brings us to the present day. Uh, we've covered the rise and fall of power of both groups over the last few decades. But what has happened in recent years with regards to Fatah-Hamas relations? So Hamas is currently receiving an astonishing amount of funding from Iran, which funnels money to terror operations across the Middle East. 
While the needs of the Gazan civilians are staggering, with over 50% unemployment, no running drinking water, and barely 4 hours of electricity per day, 80% of the money coming into Gaza is used for terrorism rather than building the essential infrastructure that the citizens of Gaza so desperately need. How do the living conditions in Gaza relate to Hamas's relationship with Fatah? So Hamas uses Fatah as a scapegoat for its internal issues. In 2019, protests erupted in Gaza due to the reality of a widespread severe poverty and the reluctance of the Hamas administration to do anything to combat it. Hamas was able to channel the public's anger at the living condition towards Fatah and towards Israel. They convinced the Gazan population that the real oppressors were Israel who bombed their infrastructures and restricted resources entering Gaza, and also the Fatah-led Palestinian Authority who collaborated with Israel and withheld funds from the Gaza Strip. That's quite a clever tactic that Hamas used, as they effectively removed all responsibility from themselves for the conditions of the Palestinian people. I suppose then, that since Fatah and Israel have been blamed for the Gazan humanitarian crisis, Hamas has become more popular. Correct. The popularity of Hamas is on the rise. That is due to the steady weakening of the Fatah and the Palestinian Authority, especially with Abbas's advanced age and medical condition. The weakness of the PA security mechanisms, especially in the northern region, enabled Jenin to become a terror stronghold and enabled the alliance then in Nablus to be formed. Hamas was there to identify and fill the vacuum created by the weakness of the PA and Fatah. So we know that since Arafat's death in 2004 that there has been an increase in factionalism within Fatah. Now with Hama Abbas's condition, this issue is again relevant. So who are his potential successors? So as of today, there are few potential candidates who can take the lead in the days after Abbas's departure. First, we have Marwan Barghouti, who was convicted and sentenced to five cumulative life sentences and 40 years in prison for terrorist acts in which five Israelis were murdered. Then we have Jibril Rajoub, who today serves as the chairman of the Palestinian Football Association and a senior member of the Fatah organization and the former head of security in the West Bank. We have Majid Faraj, who is also in the race. He is the head of the Palestinian General Intelligence Mechanisms in Judea and Samaria and former head of Palestinian security in Gaza. And we have the 60-year-old Muhammad Dahlan, who was expelled from Fatah by Abbas in 2014, following his trial in which he was accused of corruption. Dahlan is known to be very popular in Gaza and he also enjoys the support of the United Arab Emirates. Besides these four, there are others who are in the, still in the race, but one thing is sure, the race is open and there is no clear successor at the moment. So recently, the 2021 elections were cancelled at the last moment, citing the need for all Jerusalemite Palestinians to vote. Could you speak more about that, Ori? Yes, yeah, so while the official reason given for the cancellation of the elections was due to political franchise, another more significant reason for the cancellation is Fatah's internal disputes. Muhammad Dahlan was said to lead a future list, which was a Fatah offshoot. Abbas has grown older and weaker and in fighting within Fatah has left him fighting opponents from both within his party as well as external threats of Hamas. This is the real reason that the elections were cancelled. Had the elections been held, it is likely that Hamas would have gained a significant foothold within the council, whilst what is left of Fatah would have been divided into factions, leaving Abbas powerless. So, because of this infighting, is Abbas now basically a lame duck with little to no power? I wouldn't go that far. Abbas is still the president of the Palestinian Authority, meaning that even if his authority is crumbling at home, in the international arena, he is still the sole legitimate leader of the PA and therefore has the power to direct the PA's foreign policy. He leveraged his power recently when he made good on a threat he made over a year ago, warning that he would pursue legal actions through the International Court of Justice in The Hague if Israel did not return to the pre-1967 borders within a year. By getting the motion passed in the United Nations General Assembly, 
for requesting an ICJ legal opinion on Israel's occupation a few weeks ago, it is clear that Abbas's bite is still, in some regards, as bad as his bark. So, going back to what you were previously saying, what does this infighting within Fatah and the disunity in Palestinian domestic politics, what does all this mean for Israel? So ultimately, Palestinian domestic politics is and has always been of great significance for Israel. The amount of peace that Israel is able to live in be almost totally dependent on who the dominant voices is within Palestinian politics. Can you give some examples of that? Of course. During the years where uh, Yasser Arafat was powerful and dominated the PLO, there was a clear leader of the Palestinian people with which to hold negotiations. And thus, peace negotiations began with the Oslo Accords back in 1993. By contrast, in the present day, we have a totally different play field. There is no single popular leader of the Palestinian people. Abbas does not hold the same gravitas that Arafat once did within the PA, as exhibited through the functional fighting. And additionally, we are now dealing with two distinct pieces of land ruled by different authorities. Hamas is taking over the Gaza Strip, whilst the PA has authority over Palestinian areas within the West Bank. It is almost impossible to know who to negotiate with and how much weight those negotiations would bear. And since we have analyzed how different Hamas and Fatah are, both with regards to their respective ideologies, but also in terms of their willingness to negotiate with Israel, it is more difficult to secure any form of peace, firstly, with two political parties claiming to represent the same people, and secondly, when one of those two parties refuses to recognize Israel as a legitimate state. Difficulty holding peace negotiations is actually not the only implication of the disunity within Palestinian politics. It also causes one to wonder how this functional infighting in political dissent would translate itself into a Palestinian state. Fatah are fighting a losing battle in their attempts to control the Palestinian people, who increasingly opposes them due to their corruption. Hamas have essentially sworn off giving even an inch of land to Israel, meaning that even with a state based on the 1967 borders, they would continue their violence until Israel is completely annihilated. This has obvious consequences for the Jewish state, but what about the Palestinian people living under those political conditions? Hamas is already failing to deal with the humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip due to most of their funding going towards rocket buildings and other weaponry, rather than using the funds, as we've mentioned before, for much-needed infrastructure. Under Hamas, the Palestinian state would continue much the same until such time as Israel ceased to exist. Wow, so we've learned a lot today. We've analyzed the ideologies of both Fatah and Hamas and discussed their differences. We understand that the two parties are competing with each other. The rising support for Hamas also means a decrease in Fatah's control over the West Bank. We have also looked at the current political climate and why the 2021 PA elections were cancelled. We then examined the impact of Palestinian domestic politics on Israel and current events in the international arena. I'd like to give a big thank you to our Director of International Law and Public Diplomacy for joining us today. Uri, thank you. Thank you, thank you Ethan for having me here today and I hope to see you all at our next webinar.